Well, Damien, may I say right from the very top, thank you for your service. Do you hear that very often? I hear that way too much, like for me. You know, I'd really like it to, I'd like it to spread to some of the other guys. You know, there's a lot of guys who I think, you know, it's not that they feel forgotten or want to be appreciated, but words like that mean a lot, a, a lot to a soldier when they know that the, the community that they love appreciates what they've done. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood? I grew up in a, in a town called Terrigal, a little sleepy surfing town up there, which was an amazing place to grow up, but a lot of things up there, good looking girls and surf and stuff like that, which took priority when I was young. And yeah, I mean, I, it was pretty, what I could, I was pretty privileged, you know what I mean? You got running water, fresh sheets all the time, great parents, good group of mates. She was good up there. So what were you into as a kid? I surfed a lot. You know, I had a, bu a bunch of surfing. I was, I was never tough enough to play footy, which is strange. It just, yeah, I just wasn't that, wasn't that type of kid. It wasn't until I got to 20 that I sort of worked out that, you know, I started to get that burst of testosterone. I played a lot of cricket when I was young. That was sort of the sport. I loved that. Anything like a skateboards, surfboards, anything that sort of moved does into. So you're not tough enough to play football, but you sign up for the armed services. Yeah, it, wasn't, it was sort of when I was 20. I worked out that, you know, getting, getting hit wasn't that bad and stuff like that. I started, started sort of kickboxing and doing a few other things that just, I don't know, it became one of those things that, that sort of, I don't know, proving your manhood in different ways. Everyone goes through it at a, at a different stage. So I just wasn't, I don't know, I wasn't tough when I was like sort of six and seven. I got belted the two years I played footy. Absolutely belted. But yeah, yeah, so I was one of those and then I just decided at one stage that I wasn't going anywhere. You know, things were happening, bad, I saw bad things were happening around me, you know. The people who I was sort of surrounding myself with weren't, weren't reputable people, I guess, at that stage. You know, I wasn't going in a good direction and I could see that. I mean, I'm just glad that I was sort of smart enough or listened to what my folks and people around me, like the good influences at cricket and places like that said, so I could change my direction and go, all right, I gotta find something. And what can I find that's the polar opposite of the lack of discipline that I've got now, you know what I mean? And then I look, there's a picture of my granddad right next to the computer with a bunch of medals. You know, and I just looked at it, I was really proud of, at that stage, just proud of what he'd done. You know, you look at it and it's just, well, it's just mind blowing. You know, you're watching documentaries on the History Channel and you're actually, you're related to one of the guys who's been there and done it. So I started looking at it, but on the same hand was like, well, what have I ever done for anyone else? Like at what stage have I given anything for anyone else? So it sort of it turned into the idea of, okay, I'll look at the Army website, I'll see what it is. You know, I'll have a look if there's something that I think fits. And I've always been the type of guy, who, anything I do, I mean, first round of golf I played, I think I wanted to be a PGA pro straight away. You know, every single thing I do, I'd rather shoot for the stars. So they had a thing called the Special Forces Direct Recruiting Scheme. It's to see if you can take people off the street mental and physical capabilities to serve in the job. And within about 14 months, the cycle works, have them, have them ready to be posted to the unit as, as a special forces troop. I mean, the training by no means stops there. It's a continual cycle of sharpening the saw, to quite a cliche, but yeah, it's in 14 months to have you ready to deploy. And I, I saw it and decided that was what I wanted to do. Your motivation must've been strong because you ended up in a fairly elite group yeah, well, that, that, was, that was always always the goal. That was the 100% goal. And I think it just depends how badly you want something. You know, if you really want it, if you honestly want it, you'll work twice as hard to get it. You know, you do absolutely everything you can. You pull out all the stops. You know, I mean, I changed everything about my lifestyle to make me fit that equation. Mm -hmm. You know, it was every single thing. I mean, I cut my hair in this horrible flat top because I thought that was what you had to do. It was, it was disgusting. Like just horrible, but that's what I that's what I thought it was going to take. You know, I'd wake up earlier in the morning, I'd I'd run, I'd found myself training harder. You know, I had I had a reason to not go out and drink with the boys because I had to get up and train the next day because I'd given myself a purpose. You know, it's when I look back, it's probably that the happiest moment I've had committing to something like that. You know, and the whole time you're doing it, you you knowing that it's the positive end for something good, you know. You might have to go and put yourself in harm's way, but you start to look at the way of life that you've taken advantage of for, at that stage it was 20, 23, 24 years. And you start really sort of caring about that and just hoping that some other people can make the same mistakes you did. 
you say in harm's way, when you sign up for something like this, I guess in the back of your mind is the possibility that you could be seriously injured or you could lose your life. Yeah, but still, I got the choice. I, I made the choice to do it. There's a lot of people, especially the people who you go to protect or, or for, or, yeah, or situations that you're basically going to defuse or, or work in, I guess, the way forward of. Uh, people are innocent that are really getting slayed through that situation, you know. There's a lot of innocents that don't have a choice of fighting, that were just born into that situation, which I, I just don't think is fair. You know, I mean, I'd rather, I'd rather me go off and, like, choose to stand in someone's way of them raping a 14-year-old than, you know what I mean, just letting that happen, turn a blind eye, go down and have a beer. You know, it just, yeah. So, so the harm's way to me, I, I still think it, you know. I think I'm tough enough to take it. So I'll go, let's... Do you think the general public understand war? Do they understand I why? Any, I don't think anyone, if, you can't really understand war. I don't know, I mean, I, I don't really get it. You know, what I get is people. Does it frustrate that people don't know what it's like to be in that environment? No, no. The reason why people like me go off and fight is so that they don't have to. Yeah. You know, that's it. We don't, it's not, you don't, you don't do it so that people want to know what that environment's like because I think everyone that goes there wishes that it didn't exist. Yeah. You know, I mean, if it didn't, we'd be happier. If people when you serve, do you want people to know what it's like over there or you'd prefer they didn't know? I, in the Special Operations Task Group, it is better off that people don't know what you do and how you do it. You know, it's about, it's about secrecy. It's about basically keeping things under wraps to the point where you still have the advantage. Fact about that way of life is the best thing that you can do is minimise risk. That's all. The more the public know about operations that are happening, the way that they're happening, uh, solutions or things that have gone wrong during an operation, the more the enemy know. I mean, they've got the internet. You know, it's a, it's a reasonably easy thing. And when it comes down to it, if the public did know something that was going to put one of my mates at risk, or to please someone who you're doing a job that is there to protect, you know, I mean, to me, it, it weighs it up. It, I think parts of it to the public may seem not fair. You know, it might not seem fair because they'd want to know. You know, they've got people who I, I consider heroes over there fighting, doing amazing things that they can't hear about. But if, if you gave anyone the option, like if I gave you the option right now, of, okay, you can know everything that happens. But if every time you find something out like that, it costs one of those guys, mm. I know what your answer would be. Mm. You wouldn't want to know about it. So it, it's one of those, but I do, I do think that some of the, the sacrifices that get made, not only by people over there, and or more choices, but the choices that get made by people who are over there, and more importantly, their families back at home. You know, they're they're the type of things that, you know, I think they do need our support. And when it come when it comes to our support, saying thank you for your service like you did is is a lot bigger than than any charity drive or anything like that you could do.